I have to become a different person. And then I can look after myself. And then I can like, train and eat right. But first, because I'm such a bad person, I have to become a different person. And then I'm going to do all these things. Um, which it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. It's the other way around. You start doing these things. And that's how you become that different person. And it's the same with motivation. We always think that, and this is like typical, typical January 1st, maybe hangover fuel situation. We are so motivated now. And that's why we're going to take action. Motivation is like a mood. You know, you can wake up the next day and it's gone. I'm not motivated every day. It's also the other way around. Action comes first. Is it's the action that you take that triggers the motivation. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte, and we have a really great episode for you today. I am interviewing Kim Rahir. She is a former journalist turned health coach. She's a survivor of multiple sclerosis or MS turned European champion and master weightlifting. That's going to be a really cool story to hear about. She's on a mission to help women embrace muscle and strength as the solution for a host of health problems, so very much in line with our mission at Zibli, and she turns scientific knowledge about human health into actionable toolkits for everyday life, also very much in line with our mission to really help people attain and maintain their optimal health. So we're going to start out with her story, and then we're going to get into strength training and all the great benefits there, how women can get started strength training without injuring themselves. We'll talk about other lifestyle factors, especially nutrition that plays into building and maintaining lean muscle mass with age. And then we're going to try to wrap up the conversation with some tips to stay consistent and build internal resiliency. So Kim, we have a lot of great things to cover today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, you know, talk to you and thanks for all the work you do in the world. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, get started with your story. I think some people have heard about multiple scler- sclerosis or MS. Um, they may not be very familiar with the condition. They may not realize there's a couple different types. And so I think just hearing that people might want to know up front, what type of MS did she have? How is it affecting her life? How did she go from being in a, in a wheelchair to a weightlifting champion? Like, what was that story like for you? Yeah, um, I'm going to share it. I try to not be too long because sometimes I get into rambling because there's so many aspects to this, you know, the the health aspect, the, the psychological aspect and everything. It was, for me, it was actually like a double whammy because before I was diagnosed with MS, I had had an episode um, an autoimmune episode, which is called a syndrome Guillain-Barré. I know if you've heard of this. This is like a one-off. Yeah. Um, so the symptoms are are similar, but this is like it comes once and then it goes away. And that was when I was sort of in my prime. I had three small kids. I had um, just landed a, a full-time job for the first time after a while. I had been working freelance for very long, following my husband around and you know, as a freelancer, you always start from scratch and every new country that we got to because we were moving every four years, um, you start over. So I felt like I was like on, on top of the world. I had a steady job. I had my family, my kids. Um, and I had had this desire to prove that, you know, as a woman, you can have it all. You can have a good career. You can have a family, live a happy life. Um, and then from one day to the next, um, I, I was out. I was like struck down. It started with me seeing double. I mean, you're seeing double, you know, you're out of the equation. You can't work. You can't drive up to anything. Mm-hmm. And I was taken to the hospital right away, a battery of tests. And because I had various symptom, symptoms that go with different syndromes, they couldn't make up their mind with what I had. Uh, you know, was it a Guillain-Barré? Was it a Miller-Fisher? They were throwing names around and I was there in the middle of it, like scared. And mm-hmm. while I was there, I could feel my leg- legs going numb. It started with very weird sensations in my feet and uh, it moved upwards. And after three weeks in the hospital, I couldn't wiggle a toe. My legs were completely paralyzed. And it was just scary because they still hadn't said, oh, you have this and we're going to do that. Um, I think sometimes it's a bit of a 
problem with uh, neurology they have tons and tons of diagnostics you know they they subject you to stuff where they stick needles into your muscles and then wiggle them around to find out whether your nerves are still working and it's extremely unpleasant but when it comes to therapies it, there's not so much that they can do actually because i suppose this is all still quite quite confusing and it was particularly confusing for me i also had like six white coats around my bed twice a week because I was such a weird case. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of asked me permission. I didn't really want them to be there. I, I felt like a like an object, you know, that was shown to the public. Um, and I was miserable. So you, have to, you don't want to be in a hospital bed, miserable coming, then young people coming to look at you and, and marvel at your weird symptoms. <laughs> um, so that was very, very unpleasant it was scary and it it taught me many things with hindsight I'm actually grateful for this experience because I learned so much um, about what's important in life uh, but it, it was a hard time my kids were small but I realized also another lesson learned the world kept on turning you know we often think that especially as women, when we, we're not there anymore. Oh, who's going to look after the kids? Who's going to look after the house? Who's going to do my job? Who's going to organize all this? And I couldn't do any of it. And the world just kept turning. So that was, it was a great lesson. At the time, it was very painful and scary. With hindsight, I think it was, um, I'm grateful for the experience. It's also, you know, when I see people in a wheelchair, I... Um, I don't have this this uh, reaction. You know, I just think, oh, I know how you feel. I've been there. So, mm -hmm. so I can I connect to to the world better also because I have been in this in this situation. I was then treated with um, um I'm not sure how to say this in English. It's called immune glob globulins, you know, that like immune yeah. um, to help my immune system sort of become reasonable again. And that went on for a year, and then I was given a bill of clean health. Oh, wow, you don't need treatment, you're fine, it's over. It was a Guillain-Barré, which means it was a one-off, it's not going to come back. And, and so I even had a new relative. Just to clarify, sorry, the Guillain-Barré, yeah. it's almost like an immediate paralysis and it comes on very fast and then it takes a while to recover from, but you do regain all your strength. Is that Was that your experience? Yes. And I Did don't ever figure think out what it's that? the... Um, it was some kind of viral infection. It was an okay. overreaction of the system to a viral infection. They thought I had meningitis, probably. Um, but that's also a that you know I love the European public health system, but because they have to uh, you know count their pennies before they did like a full-on blood panel that looked for everything, the original infection was gone. You know, it was not detectable gotcha. anymore. Okay. Uh, but it's yeah. I think some people do have um, sort of sequels from. I mean, like, how do you call this? They don't recover completely from from this, but it depends because it can move all the way up to your upper body and then attain the autonomic nervous system, and then you need a ventilator because you won't be able to breathe. I was spared. I it really stopped at my hips, um, but it is a reaction, an overreaction of your immune system to an attack and it starts attacking your own cells and in my case it attacked my nerve cells um and you know i couldn't feel my legs like really at all it's scary but i got over it i was healthy again we moved again we moved from germany to france um and i was ready to make the most of life and like be really grateful for being back to full form and then i think it was a year after i had you stop the treatments that I felt my left hand going numb. It was like, a, at first it's like a little bit of a tingling and then I could feel the sensitivity go and I knew something was wrong. And, you know, tests again and and scans and everything. And then they said, well, this is a full-blown episode of, you know, we don't call it MS yet because it's the first time. First, first sort of episode, we don't say anything, could be an accident. Um, but it's definitely an attack of your immune system on the white substance, the white matter in your in your nerves. And um, if it happens again, you're an MS patient. And I spent a year 
telling myself that was not going to happen again because I didn't want it to happen again, as you can imagine, but it did. And it was much less noticeable than the first one. It was very mild. And I only noticed it because I was doing a weird yoga pose on the bedroom floor and I felt a tingling in my spine. Uh Uh-oh, this is not good. You know, the neurological disorders, it's always, you're always feeling stuff that you shouldn't be feeling, which is crazy. And But I knew this. I was sort of very vigilant and I knew what was going on. And I was declared a patient, MS patient, officially, which meant the doctor said lifelong treatment. And I did something that he didn't expect um, when he told me that. I asked questions. I said, hang on a minute. What do you mean? lifelong treatment that is that necessary i was really i was i was shocked uh especially because i thought the second this relapse it was so much milder it was really close to nothing right. uh, and, and i said maybe i'm getting better maybe it's not that bad but he wouldn't have any of it because you know of course he has to follow a protocol he cannot gamble and say oh no this person we're not going to treat and so we talked for an hour. It was obvious that he was not used to this. Um, and then I said, okay, I see. I have to do it. He gave me like the summer off. I think this was like um, in, in May. And he said, you can start in September. But then I had to inject myself three times a week with interferon beta. Um, and that's pretty unpleasant because the injection sites get sore. Um, and it gives you flu-like symptoms where you, you really feel that, you know, this heaviness and tiredness and, and headaches that you have when you get the flu. So, you know, I didn't want that lifelong treatment when I had to accept that I didn't want to be a sick person. So I hardly told anybody that I had this diagnosis. Um, when I had these flu symptoms, I took ibuprofen to sort of live normally. And I, I didn't want to take on that identity of a sick person and I think it that played a big role also in in my way back to to full health I also asked the doctor um if it was okay if I exercised and he said "Hmm, yeah maybe but please be careful and I don't know what that means I didn't know at the time and until this day I don't know what that means um and I think he just didn't want to commit he was not sure you know, what it was going to do to me or for me. Um, He knew that exercise is supposed to be good, but it was obviously not his expertise. So he just said, yeah, be careful. You know, like you're on your own. I don't know what to tell you. And I was lucky because I talked to a nurse who showed me how to inject myself. And she said, oh, exercise is great for MS because it makes the body fatigue resistant. And fatigue is a big problem in MS. So you exercise, your body gets fatigued, it comes back stronger, and you you train your body to do that. You'll be able to deal with, you know, whatever MS was going to throw at you much better. So I started going to the gym. Um, I armed myself with a book with a very funny, funny title. That's It would probably be totally incorrect these days, but I love that book to this day. It's called lift like a man, look like a goddess. And it was one of the first books that said women should live heavy just like men. You know, you don't don't dabble with pink dumbbells. If you want results, if you want to be strong, if you want to be healthy, you have to live you have to lift heavy weights. And that's what I did. Um I mean my like I had a bit of a, my legs were a bit at the time not that at- atrophied anymore as they were directly after the hospital. But still overall um, I was okay. I was doing okay. I could walk nicely and everything. I'm, my left hand is numb to this day because it took so long to find out what was going on. So before I got the um, steroid injection or whatever it's, it's called, um, you know, apparently there was enough damage done in my in my spine. It's hard also for a human, I think, to visualize that the fact that you can't feel properly here is something that's going on back in your in your in your spine. It's crazy. But I was okay. I could walk, um, and you know the the hand is a little bit numb, but I can grip stuff. And um, I started lifting heavy, and I start getting stronger and and fitter. And 
some things, like I was told during my Guillain Barre that the reflexes that had gone out of my body, like, you know, the one at the front of the knee where mm-hmm. you, you know, that I wasn't there, uh, you know, you could hit my knee all you wanted. There was nothing happening. And I had been told that's not going to come back. And it all came back. It all came back. It all got back to normal. And most of all, I think that's a very big, big factor in all this. I just felt good, good about myself, confident, strong. And this hospital experience where you're like so helpless, you know, in your hospital bed, people looking at you like you're a, uh, like you're like a, a weird, weird fact of science. People having to carry you to the toilet and to shower you because you can't stand. Um, I think this is what drove me to to want to you know build my strength back up and 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 feel physically independent. And I think it carries over into your mind. It carries over into how how you carry yourself and how you feel about yourself. And so with every checkup, the doctor said, "Oh, you're doing fine." And then we moved again. I found myself a Spanish neurologist, and I was lucky again because I found someone who's uh, like an MS specialist. So he's all traveling all the time, going to conventions. He's like he really knows um, what's the latest. And well, he prescribed the same treatment. I did the same thing here. And after three years, we were about to go on a camping trip in in Canada. So I said. The doctor, look, um, we're going to take the plane. You have to ask the flight attendant to put your medication in the fridge, which they hate. And most of the time they just say, no, they can't do it. Uh, and then we're going to be camping. And, and I mean, injecting myself, you know, in a, in, in a, on a campsite it doesn't feel right. Can I suspend the treatment for three weeks? And then he said, you know what? You're doing so fine. Uh, if you want to stop for good, like give it a shot or without treatment at all for longer, uh, I'll support you in that. If you don't, if you're afraid, uh, I'll support you too. Whatever you choose, I'll be with you. But you get the choice to stop. And hell yes, I want to stop. It was, so, you know, it was so, so so annoying to have to do this. And and your skin, you know, after years of always, you know, uh, hitting this the same site even though you try to sort of vary it so yes of course i want to stop of course i want to stop and this is now six and a half years ago and i have been without treatment and without any relapse all this time i'm gonna knock on wood yes i'm knocking on wood for you too that's amazing yes the crazy thing is at that time and that gave me courage and that made me respect that doctor even more he said at this point in, in time, we're not sure anymore that this treatment is actually effective. And I, I thought that was very honest and very courageous. No, because, you know, you just, this has been prescribed for many people and it was thought to be the thing that you needed to do. Mm-hmm. But he, by saying this and, and like sharing this with me, he gave me like this, this optimism and this hope that if I had been doing well, might have been just because I was really getting better and and not because of the treatment, because it was not totally clear that treatment actually did something for you. Uh, And this, like this is six years ago, I have no idea if this is still in use. I mean, I see my neurologist every year, but he makes the visits like super short, says, yeah, look good, bye. Uh, And uh, maybe it's not not in use anymore. He said, if if something happens and you need treatment again, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. So, well, good for you. I think that there's a lot of people listening who maybe have heard of MS who assumed that it was like your doctor said, lifetime, like a lifetime of medications of those injections of reduced mobility and quality of life. And you're such a shining example of the power of lifestyle and strength training. So I think I would like to go down the road of what protocol did you prescribe for yourself after reading that book? and doing your own independent research on healing yourself, what did an average week or monthly routine look like for you to start regaining your strength? I would train three times a week, and I would train mostly movement, not muscle. Now, that sounds like, Mm. uh, you know, 
like a contradiction because I say you have to build your muscle, but you have you want to build muscle, but you want to build it with movements, which means sort of everyday like movements. They sort of emulate what we do in, in everyday living. So it's only full body workouts. It was only full body workouts, and it was always that just pushing and pulling, picking stuff up from the floor and 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 maybe you know loaded carries, something like this, like really functional movements, but that you load progressively so you really become stronger. And so you I'd be deadlifting and and bench pressing and all these power lifting moves um, that I don't do anymore now because I've switched to another sport, which is also lifting weights but differently. But they're very, very functional. And I think this is um, important for everybody to to understand. I think we still have this narrative and this imagery of 70s style gyms and Schwarzenegger workouts where you pump your bicep for 550 times in order to make it grow and look a certain way. That's not very functional and that's not very real life adapted. You want to train for something that helps you, you know, pick groceries up from the floor or even a toddler, roll around on the floor with your grandkids or your kids, um, pick something up from, you know, from a shelf or even push a car, you know, that's broken down. That's, you know, that's what you do in a bench press. I just imagine I'm pushing a car and then, you know, this, it's, it's just really, it's very relevant that it's important that it's relevant what, what we do. And we have to do it in the gym because our environment doesn't give us the opportunity to 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 build that movement and functionality anymore. I'm really glad that you mentioned that. So I don't know exactly when this episode's going to go live, but what we put together recently was a YouTube playlist of all of my favorite exercise movements for strength training. And so we did core, upper body, lower body, and many, many of them are functional movements, the squats. Um, the chest press, um, you know, pulls, pull-ups, all, all the, all the stuff that you're talking about. If people are like, uh, what does that really look like? There's a playlist that's going to be up on our YouTube channel end of March. So I'm not sure when this is going to go live, but they can just go through those videos. And in them, I have dumbbell modifications, band modifications, and then bar modifications, which is something you do at the gym. And so I think if someone's just starting out and they're very intimidated to go to the gym, which I think would be a really good conversation, starting with body weight, starting with dumbbells, getting to know the movements, that's okay. That's a really good place to start. But as Kim alluded to, in order to really build strength, progressive overload is needed. And that's probably the biggest mistake that I see people make with strength training is they're not giving themselves a heavy enough load. Um, there's a lot of really awesome apps that you can do at home that, but are they really, really, really building your strength as effectively as you could do in the gym? Maybe not. And so I wanted to encourage people that this is an investment, like this is a monetary investment in a gym membership or a home gym. It's an investment in your time and it's an investment in your energy, but the return on that investment, on every dollar and minute of ounce of, and ounce of energy that you put into getting strong now will just help you soar later. So Kim, just for full disclosure, I live on a farm. Um, and so we're half an hour away from the nearest gym. And when we moved wow. to the farm, <laughs> when we moved to the farm, I said, there's no way that I'm going to drive half an hour, well, an hour total to work out for, you know, just as long, if not less. So we invested in a home gym and I love it. It's like a Smith machine. It has a squat rack. I can do bench. I can do anything I want on there. And then I'm actually working at my parents' house today. And my mom got a similar gym. I can see it right here, but it's a little bit more of a, oh, it's like a cable system. So you can put the pin in the weights and then she she can do all the movements that she wants, but it's not a free weight system, but it still has 150 pounds of load that she can use. And so I, I really wanted to encourage people when Kim says you need to go to the gym, you can also just invest and bring the gym to your home, but you do need external load. That's probably greater than your body weight. So Kim, I would love for you to describe to us, how do you educate someone 
when they're starting to learn how to weight train, how do you, if they're worried about like getting hurt, for example, how do you educate them on starting and then actually progressing that load? Yeah, the thing that I do, and it's I think it's really important that people start at the point they are at. And this is also a big mistake because you say some people say don't go into progressive overload. They keep lifting the same stuff. Um, some people also start at, at a level that is too demanding for them and then they get hurt. Um, so well, I do a full assessment of what you know, somebody's movement quality is, uh, what the strength and mobility looks like. And it could be that we actually start at home, just on the floor with the body, just starting to reconnect the brain with the muscles. Because that when we sit for decades, and I mean, it sounds dramatic, but that's what happens to some people because of their of their job, of their life. And then, you know, you drive to work, you drive back home, you, you sit at work, you sit at home. Um, the muscles kind of go offline. The, the performance of a muscle is determined mostly by the efficiency of the signal that comes from the brain. And if your brain hasn't been asked or challenged to signal a muscle to contract for a long, long time, that connection um, is not working very well. Um, so you have to first start really to get back in touch with your body, with your muscles. And that's that's how I start. I start with uh, like 50 minutes for someone just doing some very basic movements to sort of get, get that back in touch, the brain and the muscles. And the cool thing is also, and that's why that's what we call newbie gains because they always get so much stronger so quickly when they start. And you, somebody who's been to the gym for a while says, oh my God, in my first six months, I sort of doubled my this and I tripled my that. And now I'm stuck at the same weight for years. How's that happening? It's because the very first progress that you make is just the improvement of this connection between your brain and your muscles. And you want to start with that. I know it may feel sort of yeah, but I want to lift weights. I, I want to do something, but you want to be like really careful. And you can scale any type of movement. You don't, you know, you don't have to do a full blown deadlift. You can do something small or simpler. You don't have to do a full push up. You can start with a wall push up. You just want to sort of accustom your system to what's coming. Um, and then any movement of the big ones, like the pushing, the pulling, um, I always do one legged too because I think it's really important for the women I work with for balance. Um, you you can scale anything down to the like the simplest, easiest way possible to start from there. And this is mostly it's gonna be a body weight, you won't need a gym, and then you can scale it up endlessly, make it harder and harder and more complicated. But it's what you have to do. And when I say more complicated, that's also, if you're not only challenging the muscle or the muscle fiber, you're challenging the brain to, to sort of accomplish that movement. Um, and I think that's also where a lot of the benefits come from when you start training. Yeah. So again, start where you're at, even if it's at home, getting used to the movements and then slowly progress. Um, what's your recommended protocol for someone who maybe is new to strength training? Do you usually recommend like what you did was the, you know, total body type of workouts, the pushing and the pulling, or how would you progress that person along the continuum? Like how many repetitions are they doing and how many sets are they doing of these pushing and pulling types of movements? Well, if they're like a total beginner, um, and then I work with women who are, you know, in their in their forties, fifties, so you know they have a bit of mileage in their joints. Um, I start with full body movements, and it's going to be very short sessions of fifteen minutes. Um, there's going to be the sets are going to be like two or three times five repetitions, something very small, and that's. Not necessarily only like the physical aspect of this, it's also the behavioral aspect of this. Because I want to make the change that, you know, you've never trained in your life and you want to start tr strength training. It's a it's tremendous change. It's a huge sort of overhaul. So I want to make that as, as small and as gentle as possible um, just to make it a habit and to make it an easy habit. 
you know, I could very easily send a beginner to the gym and find scaled movements that they can do there that are easy to do that will create that reactivation, that reconnection and everything. But if they're a total beginner and then three times a week, I tell them to pack a gym bag, get into their car, to drive to the gym through traffic, uh, maybe even half an hour like, you know, you would have had to if you hadn't mm-hmm. built your home gym. Um, look for parking, walk through the door, go to the changing room, you know, the locker, all the stuff that you have to do. Um, and then walk onto the gym floor on top of this, which for many people is like a totally new environment and, and scary and they feel out of place and they feel everybody's, you know, looking at them and and they don't really you know what to do. I mean, even if I sent them there with a, you know, with a program in hand, they would probably find it challenging, you know, to find the right machine, to find the place where they do that exercise. And from a behavioral standpoint, you know, that's going to be so hard to create a lasting habit. That's why I start with 15 minutes at home and stuff that you can do in your pajamas to create the least possible resistance. Because there's something that goes back to a sentence that I hear all the time and that drives me crazy when women tell me, oh, I know exactly what to do. I'm just not doing it. And I want to sort of bridge that gap and say, okay, here's what you do and here's how you can actually do it every day because the the, the obstacles, the resistance that could potentially arise, you know, in your brain because you think, oh my God, this is all too much or in your life because you don't have a time to have the time to drive to the gym because something happened in your work day or in your family. So I want to make it for beginners as small as possible. And then from there we move to when you have like foundational strength um, in, in the core too, which is like really crucial, you know, t- to do all the other movements safely, you need good core strength. Then we move to three workouts a week. And if they want to, they can still do them at home. And we add equipment. Um, and some women love going to the gym after a while. And, and you know, when yeah. you get used to it. I wanted to add, I heard a quote the other day. I don't know where it's from, but it's to know and not to do is not to know. And I hear yeah. that all the time too. Like, I know what to do. I'm just not doing it. And I want to say back to know and not do is to not know. And so I think there's a difference between understanding, like, yeah, I understand what to do, but then the experiential knowing of you understand what to do and you're doing it. That's really knowing, you know, what to do in my opinion. Yeah. So I just had to back you on there. And for anyone listening who resonated with that, I just want to challenge you and remind you that if you know what to do and you're not doing it, then you don't actually know what to do because you're not doing it. Um, and Some so, people even say you don't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. um, I would like to ask you too, when did nutrition come into the picture for you? So you, it sounds like it started with exercise, but we know that that's just kind of half of the, not even like half, but like there's other things that go on to building muscle too, good sleep stress management, that kind of stuff. But when did nutrition come into the picture for you and and how did you change your diet along the way to support your muscle? That started right away, actually, with my beloved book because they went into that part too. Um, They're not like nutritionists, but they had really good recommendations. And the first thing that I did was, of course, increase my protein intake. I think it's a big, big, big thing for for so many women because it's, you know, you have to be really intentional um, about the protein. And it's it's also because of the way everything around us is built. If you, you know, just if you go to a restaurant, you will have like a menu. You have to really go looking for the protein. You know? um, if, if you are intentional, then you will find it. So I increased my protein intake and, uh, and I think like, oh, I, I'm tempted to say from day one, it made me feel just so much more energized and, and stronger. And one thing is also because it's so satiating. You 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 don't walk around uh, with an empty stomach or feeling that you don't have any fuel or anything. It's 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 just it's a big change and it's really helpful. And then for the rest, it's I mean you want to eat as much vegetables as you can and whole foods. And the rest is, you know, whatever you enjoy, whatever you love. 
um, simplify. Please, please, please simplify the food. Eat protein and vegetables and then there's any, you know, sort of allowance left. You don't even have to count calories. If you're still hungry, like really hungry, if you move a lot, you need carbs, you know, eat some high quality carbs. And yeah, by all means, if you want a donut once in a while, there's always room for a donut. If your body is well nourished, if you're giving your body all this stuff that it needs, you know, to build that muscle and to to be healthy, to function, to have a function, the meta- functioning metabolism, you know, a donut will not kill that system. Yeah. It will just deal with it so easily. If a donut is like, you know, is, if that kind of food is all you give your body, yes, then it's dangerous because it will not be able to function. But all in all, I think simplification for most women is probably the biggest, biggest thing that they should do. Because there's so much overfeeding with information that is useless. Yeah. That's a really good, um, someone told me once the info obesity online, the information <laughs> obesity. I really like that term. Yes. Um, and so I, I just keep it simple. Like we have, um, like a habit hierarchy that we teach and a lot of people, when they're thinking about getting healthy, they go straight to cutting sugar, cutting carbs. And it's like, if you can actually dial in your mindset and sleep and hydrate and eat your protein and eat your fiber, then you will naturally want fewer carbs and sugar. So I think Sometimes people's focus and energy is on not necessarily the wrong thing, but maybe not the most effective thing to get the outcome that they want. So I like that you just kept it really simple like that. Do you have um, recommendations for like the amount of protein per meal or per day that, that you recommend somebody eat? I mostly, mostly, mostly work with like an intuitive portion guide. Like you mm-hmm. want like a palm a palm sized portion of protein with every meal, and then a fist size fist sized portion of vegetables. Um, that I mean, you have to sort of get accustomed to this. It's a bit of a learning curve, but it's it's really helpful, and I think it's more pragmatic, more realistic uh, than measuring. If you love measuring and you you know want to go into the into this and you're not in danger of becoming obsessive but you're just enjoying getting your numbers by all means count macros it's something that you can do and the the, this intuitive portion size approach is a macro approach it's just not you know with uh, grams or ounces or, or milliliters or whatever you know it's just with your own hands which has the advantage that it adapts the portion size to your body size also so um and if you can stick yeah, if you can stick with that, like do that with every meal, um, you know, then you're home free. Uh, really, I I think that's that's the thing. There's also um, a behavioral aspect to this. The thing that you just mentioned when people start cutting sugar and cutting carbs, um, because I don't think that it works with the human brain in the long run. If you keep telling yourself, "I can't eat sugar," what are you? telling your brain to think about sure. um, I think yeah I think a positive nurturing building approach and that's great also because it ties in beautifully with the muscle approach you want to build some things you want to build a healthy body so you know what are the building blocks that you need and that's how you choose your food it's so much more positive and 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 I think it's just easier to do also for humans with the brain that we have than telling ourselves I can't have this. I can't have that. So what's left to eat? That's, you know, it always ends up in in disaster. I think one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this is I'm I'm a pretty good judge of energy. And I'm like, I I feel like our energetic alignment is very similar because we focus so much on language patterns and thought and mindset. And I am in complete agreement with you that I think so many people don't know a different way, you know, from, from the diet culture, from their experience, it's, I can't have this. I can't have that. I can't have that. And they don't know that there's a, a different way to speak to yourself. Um, yes. And so I think just bringing that to people's awareness that you don't have to believe every thought that pops into your head, you can choose to speak to yourself in a different way is really important. And I think that that ties into we wanted to talk about resilience and consistency here too. Um, We know the benefits of strength training. 
We know the benefits of protein. And like we've said already, so many people say, I know what to do. I'm just not doing it. What is your response to that? Like, how do you coach people to be more consistent and how does resiliency play into consistency? I think the first thing to acknowledge yeah, is that all these things that we talk about often as personal traits or, or, or character traits, like I have no willpower, I have no self-control, I have no discipline. Um, they are they they are not character traits. They are skills. They're actually skills that you can learn. Um, and once you acknowledge that, you can take all the guilt and the shame and the, you know the whole baggage out of this thing, um, because it makes it so much harder for you to 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 keep doing the right thing. For me, resilience is actually a skill where you build a safety net. Um, a safety net of habits and of support points. Like every knot in the net is a point that supports you. Um, I came up with this image because I talked to so many women who have told me, like, it's something that I find it hard to believe and heartbreaking, but they really many women tell me, I was in great shape a few years ago. I worked with a personal trainer three times a week. I ate well. I felt fantastic. I lost weight. I, I felt strong. And then they moved away and it all stopped. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself, how can you have just, you know, have your whole health, your whole happiness, your whole well-being depend on the fact that there's this one person showing up in your life? You know, that's you you can't be resilient if you if you have just this one point of, of support. True resilience, you build yourself, you build that safety net. You have other people you train with. You have other habits that you work on, like your eating habits. They, they should not rely on a person telling you what to eat every week, not in the long run. You want to build them for yourself to make them second nature. You want to have, have a supportive environment. You want to have people who, you know, who are with you, who enjoy training too, who enjoy eating a healthy food too. Um, and for everything in your life, for every healthy habit, you, you you know you want to see that as just one knot in that safety net. So if one part of that net sort of explodes or or, or breaks because your trainer moves away, or or I don't know, maybe your job changes and and you have to eat in a different place. It, thousands of things happen all the time, and this is also something that you have to realize: stuff will happen. You know, you can't be on your perfect trajectory all the time. Stuff will happen. And you want to have so many different points um, of, of fallback positions in your system that will make you resilient because then you have your net and you'll just bounce back up when something happens. One, one part of the net breaks. It's not a problem because it's, you know, it's well knit and it has many other parts that will catch you. And I think it's so... For me, the most crucial part of this is really taking the whole moral um, character aspect out of this. People are so so full of shame and guilt and think it's because of them. It's because they are bad people, because they are lazy people, because, um, no, it's all skills that anyone can learn. And you just need to, you know, be a little bit patient and take these small steps one by one to build these skills. And then you can be and do, you know, what you want to be and do. A couple images come to my mind as you're talking about this with the shame and the guilt and the regret and the worry. And if you're backpacking across the country, like maybe we'll say Denver to LA, if you're in the States and you're going to go on a long trip, the less baggage you have, the easier it's going to be to get to your destination. And so I think a lot of people silo their mental health from their emotional health, from their physical health, and to the detriment, first of all, of all three, because the more mental and emotional weight you carry around, I call it mental weight and physical weight, you got you have to lose both of them. And so the less shame, guilt, regret, and worry you carry around, the easier your destination will be. 
And so I like that you alluded to, we need to stop. One of my guests once said collapsing morality with their weight or with their eating habits. And it's like, I ate good today. So I'm a good person. I ate bad today. So I'm a bad person. And, you know, millions of people walk around this earth thinking like that. And it's so unfortunate because it's not supporting their ultimate goal. That kind of mental health, emotional health is not conductive to the physical health they want to, that they want to experience. So I think that we can't ignore the mental and physical and emotional aspects that they are all intertwined. So that was yes. one image that came to my mind was just let, let, lay your baggage down, stop it. But here's the deal, Ken. I think a lot of people struggle with that because it's been the fuel for their trip. So not, not only is that baggage weighing them down, but it's also fueling them forward. So they're used to motivating themselves from guilt, from shame. And so it's this negative cycle where I ate bad today. I'm a bad person. I better get my crap together. Okay, now I'm motivated to do better. So that motivation came from that self guilt or shame or whatever you want to call it. So I think part of this whole journey is learning to number one, release the baggage to number two, start motivating yourself with different fuel. How would you coach someone through that process if they're used to walking around with a lot of guilt and shame and motivating themselves from that place? It's, um, I, I call it turning it around, like from its head on its feet, um, because the, the basic, uh, the underlying idea is I have to become a different person. And then I can look after myself and I can like, train and eat right. But first, because I'm such a bad person, I have to become a different person. And then I'm going to do all these things, um, which it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. You start doing these things and that's how you become that different person. And it's the same with motivation. We always think that and this is like typical, typical January 1st, maybe hangover fuel situation. We are so motivated now. And that's why we're going to take action. Motivation is like a mood. You know, you can wake up the next day and it's gone. I'm not motivated every day. It's also the other way around. It's action comes first. It's, it's the action that you take that triggers the motivation. You can't wait for motivation to get you to take action. It, it's far too fickle. It's totally unreliable. Um, and it's, it's, and it's not, it's not going to carry you the distance. It's the action first and then you get motivated. And yes, it can be hard. That's why we make the action so tiny and small, yeah. but that small action gives you positive reinforcement. I've done this. I've done this. I've gone on a walk today. That's great. You feel good about yourself. And then you want to do that again. That's how, you know, it's from from the, I don't even want to say it's from the outside in because it's all, as you said, intertwined. But we tend to think that, you know, our, like you said, it's like silo, but that's our physical health and this is our mental health. Um, and if we actually use that, that lever that we have with our physical health, with our body, we can use our body to improve our mind. We have to just take these small steps and not think that, you know, it's it's something in us that has to change and that has to become a certain way for us to be able to do good things. We start doing good things and then the person that we are will be a different one. I just think I have to pause and say, I think that's one of the wisest insights that's been shared on this podcast is I want to repeat it so that no one misses it is you don't wait until you're someone else to be able to do the things that you want to do. You do the things and then you become kind of the next version of yourself is how I like to phrase it. You know, it's like Morgan 1.0 versus Morgan 2.0. I am not who I used to be. I'm a better version of that. And it's just like our iPhone. It's not like we want to go back in time and be like, give me that iPhone one back because <laughs> the, Please. you know, we, no. we're continually learning about life and growth and evolving and, and that's how it's supposed to be. So for, I think that if anyone is finding themselves in a state of procrastination, oh, I'm going to do that one day. 
I'll get to that Monday. I'm going to start next month. That's usually a sign that you're dealing with something like what Kim is talking about. Like some sort of fear is holding you back from stopping. Um, maybe you feel like you have to change. And I think, Kim, this is a little bit where the all or nothing mindset comes in, where people are like, I can't do anything until I can do it all and I can do it perfectly. And I definitely can't do all of that right now because I'm way too busy. So I just wanted to reinforce to people, like, drop that, drop the all or nothing mindset, meet yourself where you're at with grace and compassion, but show up for yourself. No one, is, no one else is going to show up for you. No one else can build this safety net for you of resiliency. I really, I wanted to thank you for that image because I really, really like that too, where if one of the knots falls apart, the other ones can support you while you knit that one back together. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to kind of wrap up the conversation with where are you at today with your fitness journey? So you are a champion. I'm kind of curious about that. And you said that you started, you know, total body strength training three times a week, but you're doing something different now. And just, I'm kind of curious on a personal note, what, what is the level of dedication that you have to commit to your fitness to be that champion? Okay. Yeah. So I was training with a personal trainer in a commercial gym and that's now, I think it was like seven years ago. And he said, I mean, he loved working with me because, you know, I was a woman who wanted to lift heavy weights and, you know, there weren't so many around. And then he said, Kim, how do you feel about trying Olympic weightlifting? I'm going to show you the moves. Maybe you'll enjoy it. And I said, yeah, why not? Um, so it's two moves. It's One is called the snatch and the other is a clean and jerk. The idea is to put the bar overhead. One is in one move and the other is in two moves. So I tried it and it's incredibly difficult. It's it really, you know, oh, super challenging. But I, I was kind of hooked because it's a mix. You need strength, but you need technique also. So it's a different challenge for your brain. And I did that with this trainer for a year in a commercial gym, which is crazy stuff. Because in Olympic weightlifting, you lift, lift the bar overhead and then you drop it. Because, right, you, you know, it's drop it. You can do that in your house because yeah. you probably crack your floor. Yeah, no, and and you and you can't do it in, in a normal gym because yeah, you oh. you know you destroy the plates and you destroy the floor. That's yeah. why they have special gyms for that. And I, after a year, I I loved this so much that I signed up with a pure weightlifting club, and um, and I, you know, it's the best thing I ever did. It, first of all, because it's 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 a club. You know, there's no mirrors, there's no music. It's just you know iron and the trainer telling you what to do. Um, I lift with people who are. 16 and people are 60 uh, you know this is, is fantastic and we in a way we all do the same because you lift at percentages of your maximum uh, lift that you have um, and I had been going there for two weeks when someone came to me and said hey Kim great day training here uh, do you want to compete and, and I said, what you mean compete do you do know how old I am yeah of course look over there that's Mary she's like three years older than you she's competing and said well okay let's do this uh, and that's how I started and this is of course this is a whole body training like you know it, you know it doesn't get more whole body than this because your entire you it looks like you're lifting it with your arm but you're actually lifting the whole weight with your body in an explosive movement I mean I'm you know I'm 60 now I'm not particularly explosive but I'm doing my best, you know, to do it in an explosive way. Um, so it's it's just you have to, you know, it's it's physical, but it's physics too. You have to find the most vertical way for the bar to move upwards mm -hmm. because that's how it's going to weigh the least in your perception. You know, if you lift it in front of the body, it's going to feel so much heavier. And then to lift it vertically, I mean, your body's in the way, right? So you have to, you have yeah, to you learn have to, the moves. Yeah, it's, I, it's a difficult thing. <laughs> um, I've tried, I have, I've done it with, oh, like 10 pounds on each side of a 45 bar. And so for people who aren't familiar with the movement, you can like YouTube clean. Is it C-L-E-A-N? Yes, it's like you clean it off the floor. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Or a jerk. Is it a jerk and clean or clean and jerk? Or how, it's a how clean and jerk. Yeah. yeah, clean and, and jerk. So the clean is like 
you're lifting it up and you kind of snatch it like that with your hands, right? And then it like sits. Yes, a little you bit. put it on your shoulders. Put and then from shoulders. there, it goes overhead. And then the jerk part is where you push the entire bar and weight overhead. So I'm really curious, yes. how much can you lift? I love talking to people just so I can think about you when I'm lifting. Oh, um, my my best in the, in the cleaner jerk is something like, um, it's 50 kilos. That's around, It's around 100 pounds. Wow. Um, and in the snatch, it's, uh, it's, I think it's 35 kilos. So it doesn't sound like much, but you know, when it's on the floor and you have to put it overhead in one move, um, I don't know how much that is. That's maybe 80 pounds or something. Yeah. Okay. Just to clarify, you said snatch. Will you clarify what the snatch is versus the clean yeah. and jerk? And the yes. Clean and jerk the over? snatch is where, you, where you lift the bar overhead in one move from gotcha. the floor to overhead. Wow. So that's the one that's that's technically more demanding, and that's where you, you know you lift a little bit less. The second one, the clean and jerk, is is more. You can get further with with a bit of brute force because mm -hmm. um, you kind of have this pause you have in the to, middle to like load yeah. the legs and then really yeah. lift it up. Fun. Okay. Yes, that's great. So I think leaving. Did you have anything else that you wanted to share with women about and men? Just about how strength training, strength training consistently has really changed your life, changed your health, changed your outlook, changed your mental attitude, or anything like that. It's just made me a different person. Um, uh, I'm more confident. I'm happier. I'm healthier. Um, I, I get up in the morning and I'm looking forward to my day. Um, and I think it's really worth giving it a shot and. The one thing that I I want to say about this, giving it a shot, is you know don't don't look at the big picture if you want to start something new. Don't look at the long road ahead, and you know you've never maybe you've never even touched a dumbbell, and you think, oh my god, how on earth am I ever going to? This is not for me. You know, just focus on the next tiny tiny thing that you can do today. You know, maybe go visit a gym and, and look at a dumbbell, or or maybe you know Google a trainer. Whatever it is, something small that you can do today. Don't worry about, you know, what's ahead, what's going to be with you in five years or whatever. Do something now today and give it a shot with the strength training because you it's something. I've never heard anyone say, gee, I wish I would have started this later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, for a lot of people too, just one limiting thought that could pop up is a lot of our audience members are trying to lose weight. And so they're still stuck in that calories in calories out. I'm burning more calories while I'm on the elliptical or running or walking than I am weightlifting. And so will you just really quick address that limiting thought that in order to lose weight, you need to burn a bunch of calories doing cardio, like how does strength training play into the weight loss and maintenance picture? There's a, there's a really very simple hierarchy of of I'm going to call it fat loss because you know weight loss is not necessarily uh, you know depending on on where you're at what you what you want there's a simple hierarchy of fat loss the first point on that you have to you know dial in is your eating number two is eating too because it's that important and number three is strength training and that's it if if you have an hour a week, you know, for any kind of exercise activity, you want to go and strength train. If you mm -hmm. have two hours, you want to still do the same thing. If you have three hours, you want to still do the same thing. If you have uh, five hours, then you can maybe throw in a little bit of cardio. But you need that muscle mass first for your overall health anyway. And it's, it's the one that's going to keep your engine humming mm -hmm. because muscle is so, muscle is so, costly when it comes to energy just to maintain that muscle your body's going to burn energy that's fantastic and if you sort of try to do it with cardio I, it's i look at it like a flash in the pan you know uh, and you, you eat carbs they get burned off in the in the cardio but you were just left where you were before you haven't changed your body you've just burned fuel mm -hmm. and you want to change your body you want to build that muscle that's going to um, you know make it so much easier it's also 
going to allow you to eat more carbs. I know this sounds so simplistic, but it will because, the, you know, the muscle is the storage site for for sugar in the body. So if you have a big storage site, you you can eat more carbs without endangering your health or, or worrying about, yeah. you know, diabetes or insulin and, and things like that. So it, it really, in, in the hierarchy of exercise for fat loss, strength training is king. Yeah. And I also want to just comment that you can get some cardio from strength training too. Like your heart rate is still going up when you're strength training. It's a little bit more of an intermittent, you know, heart rate elevation and and decline, but it's still there. Um, I'm training for a half marathon in May. So that's running 13 miles. And I genuinely enjoy that. But I also recognize that is secondary in my training protocol. Like a non-negotiable for me is strength training at least twice a week. The running comes after that, you know? So I think that for anyone who's kind of stuck in that cardio mindset, what do you have to lose by starting strength training? You're already living the worst case scenario with what you're currently doing. So the best case scenario, yeah, you're already living your worst case scenario. You have nothing to lose by starting gently. Um, And really the YouTube playlist, I hope, is going to be a really good resource for people interested in learning some strength training techniques and how to make things easier and how to make things harder. But I know that you have a lot of awesome resources too. So can you let people know where they can learn more about you? Yes, they can go to my website, which is kimrahir.com. And on there, there's a, a free assessment that you can take to find out, you know, what your status quo is. It's it's not only about strength, it's a strength and health assess- assessment. So you can find out your, you know, what your situation is right now, because that's what you need to really um, know if you want to move forward. You want to go from A to B, you want to know what A is, and you can find out on my website with that assessment. You can also follow me on Facebook uh, with my name, Kim here, where I share my lifting stories, my adventures, uh, lots of free trainings and and tips and um, nice community on there. So if you um, want to follow there, you can get a feel for what I do and, and how I do it. Or you can just email me if you want to at Kim at KimRahir.com. I'll always answer. Thank you. Well, it was a delight to talk with you today and best of luck with your training moving forward and with the impact that you're making with women worldwide. It's amazing. I appreciate your time today, Kim. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks.